at the. I was looking at the uh, group of us on the platform last night. I felt a little bit out of place because I think I'm the youngest of those of us over here, and I have the most mature hair of any of us. <laughs> anyway, um, it's been mentioned to me a couple of times that um, I'm a teacher and not a preacher. And I got to thinking about a couple of things that make a teacher different than a preacher. The first one is I don't have to stop until a bell rings. I think that's 12 noon at lunchtime, so that gives me a little bit more freedom. Um, second thing is that usually preachers don't give you homework or quizzes, and teachers do. Um, that's a little warning. But I was, as I was thinking about it, I also realized there's one thing that isn't different between preachers and teachers. Um, when my wife and I both were education majors, and one of her education teachers gave the definition of learning as new information, I'm changing it somewhat, but new information that changes your behavior. That's ultimately the purpose of either a teacher or a preacher, is to give you something from God's word that changes your behavior, that changes your life. And I hope this week in sharing some things with you, um, no one will be surprised to know we're going to be spending a lot of time in Genesis uh, but in spending some time in Genesis this week and some other places in Scripture, I hope that I can share with you some things that will um, change your life, maybe in little ways, maybe in big ways, but at least to share with you something from God's Word that will be uh, a benefit to you. Back in the 1990s, I ran across an advertisement for a new Macintosh laptop that I thought was really interesting. They had a picture of their Macintosh laptop in the middle, and across the top it said, we would say that our laptop is the best in its class, except it's the only one in its class. And I thought of that, when I saw that headline or that, that ad, I immediately thought of God, because in some ways we can say God is the best in his class. Scripture, in fact, refers to him as God of gods. And in one sense, if you take all the gods of all of the religions of the world and you put them all together, God is the greatest in the class. But in another sense, he is the only one in his class. Those other gods don't really measure up to being in the same class with God just because we give them a similar name. And I want to talk this morning about Genesis and God. But I want to start in Romans chapter 1. So if you would turn with me to Romans chapter 1. I want to start there as we begin to think about what Genesis has to say about God. Well, part of Genesis at least. Romans chapter 1, though, is where I want to start. Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18. Romans chapter 1, starting with verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, I'm just taking a few verses out of this chapter. This chapter is, is full of, of important topics. But I just want to pull out a little that part of it. Paul starts out by saying that the condemnation is coming on the whole world for the simple reason that the whole world has a knowledge of God. How do they have a knowledge of God? He says, the invisible things of God from the creation are clearly seen. You can see God in his creation. You can clearly see God in his creation. You can, they can be understood by the things that he has made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There is no excuse because if you look at the creation, you can see God. Let's start in Genesis chapter 1 now, going back to creation. And let's look at some of what it describes there as part of God's creation. And what does it teach us as we look at God's creation? What does it show us about God? What does it reveal to us about God? Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 1. In the beginning... Let's stop there. In the beginning... The beginning of what? The beginning of time. Time is not eternal. Time is limited. Time has a beginning. Time has an end. It is really difficult for us as humans to think outside of time. 
time is just what we are. We live in time. Um, I read someplace the rate of time is one second per second. Um, how fast does time go? We really don't even have a comprehension of that because we just live it. Uh, we can't imagine eternity. In fact, when you hear eternity described, it's described as a long, long, long time. We don't do a good job of thinking of true timelessness. And yet, if you were to step back, catch this, if you step back a moment before creation, you can't do that because there's no moments before creation. I don't know how to describe it, but if you were somehow able to view before time began, there's no time there. It's simply timeless. God is not a creature of time as we are. God is outside of time because he made time. You can't be controlled by something or contained in something that you've created. When God began with time, it does not re God is not restricted by time the way we are. I've, worked, I've, I've taught this before, and I, whenever I teach it, I end up not knowing what I'm talking about because I don't think we can reach outside of time to understand timelessness. Let me share a couple of thoughts with you. I'll share one from another, um, Dr. Swenson, and he just does a couple of things that I think are kind of neat to maybe give a little picture, maybe not sufficient, but at least a starting point. Um, he's, he's envisioning a, t a conversation with God. He has 10 minutes with God. And in the middle of this conversation, the, the doctor says, could I see you answer some prayers? God says, of course. The doctor says, when? Oh, I just did. What? I just answered prayers. Whose prayers did you answer? Actually, I answered 924,338 prayers just then. Half of them from people who didn't even realize it. That often happens. Just that thought. You know, I answered some prayers. Okay, I, I'm done. It doesn't take God time to answer prayers. And the other one that I thought was interesting was at the end of it. Um, the doctor says, how much of my 10 minutes do I have left? And God says, just a few seconds. Of course, around here, that might also mean 50,000 years. You never know. But in your case, it means just a few seconds. But when we start talking about God and time, we really are not... It's a difficult concept because God is not controlled by time. The best illustrations I can think of myself, if you are writing a book and you are telling a story in the book, in your book there is time. But as the author, you are not controlled by the time of your book. You may take days figuring out how to write the next 10 seconds. Or you may take 10 seconds to cover the next 10 years. You, don't have, you are not controlled by the time of your book. In the same way, God is not controlled by the time of his creation. He is outside of time. Now, I should clarify, there are some philosophers who have a different perspective of God's relationship with time than what I'm presenting. But I think it's important for us to understand that because God created time, he is not controlled by time as we are. He is eternal, truly eternal, truly timeless. Um, another way of thinking of, I, of time is, is very much a one-dimensional thing. If you think of it, you draw a line. That line has a be can have a beginning and an end, and it just goes. You can move along that line. You can move back and forth along the line, perhaps, although we've never figured out how to do that in time. But you can move back and forth across that line. But if you are constrained to that line, that's all you have. But if you were a person looking at that line, you can step back. You can see the whole line. You can touch here. You can touch there. You're not controlled to stay on that line because you are outside of that line. God is timeless. In the beginning, God created time. Let's continue. In the beginning, God created the heaven. Let's pause there. What does it mean by the heaven? Now, it can't mean what we often think of as heavens. Well, let's say, let me pause. It doesn't mean where God lives. That's not what it's referring to in this context. I think that's obvious. But it's also obvious it doesn't mean the heavens like we usually think of it. When we say look at the heavens, we mean the stars. But the stars are not created until day four. That's not what he's talking about here. What is he talking about? And I could be wrong on this, but I think what, he mean, what it means here is that God created the heavens. That's when God created space. Okay. Space also often means the, the stars. I don't mean that. I mean three-dimensional space, the place where things go. Let me try to illustrate it this way. Often, if we were telling the creation story to children, we would start with something like this, and we would say, God started with nothing. This is not nothing. This is something. 
This is a place where we're going to start putting stuff that we create. When God started, he didn't have a place to put the stuff he was going to create. He had nothing. Excuse me. He had nothing. Before God could put things in his creation, he had to create a creation to put them in. He had to create a place where everything would go. If you step back before creation into that non-time before creation, you have no place to be either because there's nothing there. There's not even a place to put things yet. God created from the beginning, he started with what Francis Schaeffer calls nothing, nothing. It's not just nothing, it's nothing, nothing. There's nothing there at all. There's not even a thing to be there. No other creation story starts that far back. If you, re if you read your pantheistic or your ancient mythologies, they always start with something, somewhere, sometime. They don't start with nothing, nothing. If you ask an atheist today, they will explain to you that the Big Bang starts with nothing, nothing. But even when they do, then they explain how the laws of science brought out of nothing, nothing, something. Which means they don't have nothing, nothing. They have nothing with the laws of science already operating. They are still starting with something. Only the Bible starts with nothing, nothing, and God. And really, that's the only way it makes sense. Because if, it's, if an atheist wants to tell us, okay, we start with nothing except scientific laws, the obvious question is, where did the scientific laws come from? There has to be some explanation somewhere. You've got to stop with someone or something. And that becomes your God. The laws of science become your God if that's what you start with. If that's the one thing that always was, that becomes your God. The God of the Bible, though, is that uncaused cause, that beginning point when there was nothing, nothing. So at no time, nowhere, when there was nothing, God started. That's where what he's described. When God created, but because God created space, that means God's not controlled by space. We use the phrase omnipresence to describe that God is everywhere. In a sense, that may be misleading because that implies that God is kind of big and spread out over everything. And that's one way of looking at it. But in another sense, he is everywhere because he's not forced to go anywhere. He simply can be everywhere simultaneously because space doesn't control him. If we go back to the author in a book, if you're an author in a book, you don't have to travel from place to place in your imaginary world that you've created. You can go from place to place instantly because you're not controlled by the space of your book. God is not controlled by our space. Millions of miles or 10, sec or 10 micrometers is the same difference to God because he's not controlled by our space because he made it all. Right there from the beginning, God, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. What is the earth? Well, actually, if you keep on reading, it implies in verse 2 that it was water. God created a, a ball of water. Details aren't here. Um, a lot of theory about it. But it seems that what God created here is, is water. To a scientist, water is matter. And on a little bit higher level, in, according to modern physics, that's matter and energy. Because matter and energy are two forms of the same thing. At this point, God created the raw stuff with which we, everything else is made. He creates the time first. Then he creates a place to put everything. And then he creates the raw elements out of which everything is made. If you start not with water, but with the electrons and the protons and the neutrons that are in the, in the, in the compound of water, that's what everything's made of. The whole universe, as far as we know, is made of basic atoms of about 120 different elements. God created it all right there with all of the energy there. God is the source of all matter and all energy. We say God can do anything. Why can God do everything? Because he's the one who produced everything in the first place. God is not more powerful than anything we see in creation. He is so far beyond more powerful that that's not a proper comparison. Because all of the energy from every star that has burned for the 6,000 years so far, all of that energy came from God. All of the energy in our children came from God. All of the energy and all of the power plants and all of the natural fuels, all of that came from God. All of the energy that's stored in every nucleus of every atom in all of the matter in the universe, it all came from God. 
All of that came from him. He can handle our problems. He is outside of our concept of energy. God is beyond powerful. He is beyond energetic. He is the source of every concept of energy that we have. It all came from him. And I don't really get the sense in Genesis chapter 1 that it stressed God very much doing it. And I think we see that even more maybe in the next section I want to look at. Let's go on in Genesis chapter 1 to verse 12. We're skipping a few days. I could pause on almost any one of these days and spend time, but I'm not going to. Um, I picked out a few that, I, that stood out to me as I was studying. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, starting with verse 12. Excuse me. Verse 14. Verse 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and to rule over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. The phrase that stands out to me in reading over this in verse 16 is the last five words, he made the stars also. Now, I understand in, somewhat, in some way why God spent a more time with the sun and the moon. They are much closer to us. They have a much greater influence on our lives day by day. But that phrase, he made the stars also. It's almost how it feels like a throwaway line. God builds, he makes the sun, he makes the moon, and oh yeah, he made some stars. Not really that important, but just to mention it. Just kind of tossed off. And yet as we begin to study the stars... That phrase carries so much power in it. <clears throat> we, of course, um, have a, a, a sun, which physically is a star. Um, it's a special star. It's given specifically to us, so it's a, it's a special star. But physically, it's, it's just like the, the stars. If you were to, different numbers, but about one million Earths could fit inside the sun. Okay, you could take the earth one million times and stick it in the sun and you'd have space to fit it all in. It's big. But it's far from unique. And you, some of this I'm sure you've heard, but um, we are part, our sun is part of a, of a galaxy called the Milky Way Galaxy. We're out on one of the arms of the galaxy and kind of a, a um, sparsely populated part of our galaxy. Um, our galaxy, they estimate, I don't think they've ever counted this directly, but they've estimated about 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And if you wonder how you count that, I actually had a homework assignment when I was in grad school where you take a little section of, the ga of a galaxy, you blow it up, you count all the stars in a little section, and then you multiply to guess how much there is in the whole thing. That's kind of the, kind of the process that you go through to try to figure out how many stars there are in a galaxy. And they estimate that our galaxy, Milky Way galaxy, has about 100 billion stars in it. But scientists now have learned in studying with some of our newer telescopes that our galaxy is not the only galaxy in the universe. There are lots of galaxies in the universe. Um, with the uh, Hubble telescope, they were able to take a very small section of the sky, go very, 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 very far out, and then count the galaxies in this little section of the sky, multiply it for the whole sky, and estimate at about 100 billion galaxies but 100 billion galaxies, and that's a low estimate. I've seen estimates up to 100 times larger than that. Let's go with 100 billion galaxies. 100 billion galaxies, each of which would have about 100 billion stars, which comes out to about 10 billion trillion stars in the universe. About. Now, of course, we, we start talking about trillion of dollars of debt, and most of our eyes start to glaze over. We're talking about a 10 billion trillion stars. Um, how, do you en how do you envision a number like that? Well, I, I've done this a number of times. When I started out, I talked about a 1 gigahertz computer because they were just barely on the market. Now I've gone up to a 5 gigahertz computer because computers keep getting faster. So let's use a 5 gigahertz computer that can count 5 billion stars a second. A okay, fairly fast computer. Not necessarily, a, not, not top of the line, but fairly fast computer. We're going to count five billion stars a second. And we're not doing anything fancy with them. Just name them off, or just count them off. Five billion stars a second. 
in 60,000 years, your computer will finish. 60,000 years at 5 billion stars per second to count the stars. Let's, let's skip real quickly to Psalm 147. Psalm 147, verse 4. Psalm 147, verse 4. Talking about God. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. So I gave you an estimate. If you want to know the detail, ask God sometime, and he can give you the exact number. Um, You'll probably be dead when you get to ask him that question. But it's okay. You'll still know then after you ask him. He can tell you how many stars there were. But God has a name for every star. When I was in Taiwan, I had a couple hundred students a semester. And I, by the end of the year, I knew most of their names. And usually I could remember their names from a couple of years before. It didn't push me too far back. A hundred billion trillion stars, and he knows them by name. But you know what's really, what stands out is this is not, the, I mean, already God made the stars also. You know, just a hundred billion trillion stars, just tossed them out there. Except he didn't just toss them out there. We're discovering that there is structure to the universe. This has been in the last few years. They discovered those galaxies are not just kind of tossed out there uniformly. In actuality, if you were to go out about um, a million light years, which would be, a, a light year is the distance that light travels in a year, which is about six trillion miles which I think if you pay a dollar a mile, wouldn't that get pretty close to paying off our debt now? So in a light year, you could pay off our debt at a dollar a mile. But this is at, at one million light years out there. There is a, a sphere of galaxies between our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy that we are in. If you go out there about a million light years, you will find very few galaxies until you get out about a million light years. And then you will find all kinds of galaxies at that distance. And then you go out another million light years, and in that million light years, there'll be a few galaxies, but not many. But at two million light years out there, all of a sudden there's a bigger sphere with more galaxies, lots of galaxies. If you go out another million light years, there's another sphere with more galaxies. God didn't just toss them out there. He is constructing a sculpture made up of galaxies. I didn't mention this. A galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. So about 600,000 trillion miles across and God is using these little blocks to make himself this interconnecting spheres of galaxies and the Bible says oh yes he made the stars also just a little note there just to mention to us that he did have some other stuff he was doing at the same time it's mind boggling when you begin to study God's creation the vastness of God's creation it, it goes beyond our comprehension actually and I was thinking about, as I was thinking about this, we admire people who work with big sculptures. Mount, the four uh, presidents on Mount Rushmore, um, Stone Mountain with Lee and Jackson and Davis on their horses. We admire those who can work in these massive sculptures. We also admire those who can work with very minute sculptures. When we were in Taiwan, um, in the National Museum, they had a peach pit that had been carved into a small boat with a group of poets who were having dinner on the boat. And they had a microscope or a a magnifying glass so you could actually see the carvings. And this is not unusual. The Chinese are are known for their peach pit carvings and other almost microscopic carvings that these men did by hand. We admire that as well. When you look at God, we can go out to the galaxies. And I, let me do it with you, just real quickly. Don't, don't worry about trying to follow all of this, just to get a feel for the size of our, of our world, of our universe. A man is about two meters tall. A person is about two meters tall. About a thousand times larger than that would be a kilometer, which would be about six-tenths of a mile. A thousand times larger than that, and you're about talking about the, the length of California. A thousand times that, and you're talking about the diameter of the sun. A thousand times that... And we're talking about the distance between the sun and the planet Saturn. A thou- a 10,000 times that, and we're about a light year. 
a hundred times that, and you have what, about the size of what they call a globular cluster. It's kind of like a miniature galaxy, a, a bundle, a bunch of stars. A thousand times larger than that, and you're up to the size of a galaxy. Ten times that, and you have those galactic shells I was talking about. And about 10,000 times that, and you're at the edge of the universe. It's big. If you go the other direction, you start at the size of a man, you go about one thousandth of that, and you're about a thickness of a dime. A thousandth of that, and you're about the size of a bacteria. A thousandth of that, and you're about the width of your DNA that carries your genetic code. A hundredth of that, and you're down to about a hydrogen atom. A hundredth of that, you're down to the nucleus of the atom. A hundredth of, or sorry, a tenth of that, you're down to the proton. Somewhere between a hundredth and a thousandth of that, you're down to an electron, and a tenth of that, you're down to a quark. We think that might be the smallest thing in existence, but they keep finding smaller things, so who knows? And the point I wanted to make with, with doing that, and I know it, it's just too many numbers too fast, but the point I want to make is that God not only created with the universe as this massive sculpturing, he also created down into the sub-microscopic, sub-atomic level things that we are just barely able to comprehend in its minuteness. Um, man isn't quite in the middle, but we are near the middle of the, of the massive scale of God. I heard a story, and I don't know if it's a true story or not, but it, it could be, and if it isn't, it should be. Um, there was a, a scientist who told that he was um, studying the stars and studying, using his telescope and studying at night each night, studying the stars, and he said after a few months of this, he started to feel so small and so insignificant. And he began to wonder how God could care about him when he was looking at the vastness of our universe. But then the weather changed and it became cloudy and he couldn't see much with his telescope. And so he had pulled out his microscope and began to study the microscopic world that God had made. And he suddenly realized that if God cared so much about such small things, he certainly cared about him. And I think when we look at God's creation, we should feel both our insignificance and our significance. In the context of the universe, we are nothing. And atheists will tell you that's in fact what we are, nothing. But when you look at the, that how God took so much care of just the cell, the human cell. I get to teach biology this year. Um, and I enjoy some parts of biology. And teaching the cell is fun because it's this little teeny microscopic thing you can't hardly see. And I, can, and I can write a test that's 10 pages long with all the stuff, just introductory stuff, on the cell that's not even close to what we actually know is in the cell. It's so complex just at that level. And that's not even the lower level. Last year I taught, physical, uh, taught chemistry and physical science and we were looking all the way down into the atoms and the electrons and the protons. And it's just so much detail. Our God is a God of both the massive and the minute. He, the whole scale. And we're somewhere in the middle and God certainly cares about us. I'm sure you could find that in other ways as well from Scripture. But just looking at his creation, we are not insignificant. We're right in the middle of his creation. <clears throat> Changing thoughts slightly. Carl Sagan uh, made a statement. Carl Sagan was big into the SETI movement, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And Carl Sagan said, A single message from space will show that it is possible to live through technological adolescence. It is possible that the future of human civilization depends on the receipt of interstellar messages. He had devoted a large part of his life, a lot of technology, to trying to find one intelligent communication from space that would prove that there was life out there somewhere. And scientists actually have found a message that indicates that there might be life out there somewhere. Um, it was actually a fairly lengthy message. Um, it, actually was as long as 90 volumes of Encyclopedia Britannica. So it was a fairly lengthy message. As they began to decode this message, they discovered that this message was actually the blueprints for building a self-contained spaceship. It includes um, how to build the spaceship, the structure of the internal structure of the spaceship, the power plants, factories to produce everything the spaceship would need, um, recycling centers, uh, quality control, internal transportation and external transportation, garbage disposal, water management, environmental controls, and it even had directions for how this spaceship could make a second spaceship exactly like itself. 
And as they continued to, to, to analyze this message, they discovered that not only did it have that information, but it also had information on how billions of these spaceships could come together into a single fleet where each one could be independent, but instead each one would have a tailored purpose within the whole fleet, each one with a, a um, specialization that would serve the whole and would serve the purposes of the whole fleet to work together and included in those directions how to create a second fleet identical to the first fleet. That's a lot of information. But it was but even more amazing was the fact that this information with all of this building plans and all of these instructions was stored on a, in in basically encoded in chemicals and the, the, the entire message was about two nanometers wide. That's two trillionths of a meter wide. And about 30, uh, in, in spirals, about six feet long. So a good length of a message. And they, it was found stored in a two micron container. Okay, I know those little numbers don't work. So just imagine that this message was written on a 125 mile long fishing twine and stored in a basketball. That would be the equivalent. So this, this huge amount of information was stored in this microscopic chemical um, structure that was compactly stored so efficiently. Some of you probably caught on. I was talking about the DNA that you have a few billion copies of in your body. It's a message that contains information. It proves there's life somewhere. Interestingly, Carl Sagan never recognized that one. If he had gotten a message from the outer space that said one plus one equals two, he would have gone, ah, there's life out there. But when he was informed of, which I'm sure he was intelligent enough to have been informed of, this 90 volumes of his Encyclopedia Britannica that were stored in each and every one of his cells, he goes, oh, it must have happened by accident. No. When you see information, you know there is an intelligence behind the information. The, intel the, the DNA is proof. It is evidence of an intelligence behind the creation. Um, I'm sure it comes far short of completely looking at the intelligence of God, but it is evidence at least that there is intelligence of the universe. There is intelligence behind the universe. And I was mentioning human DNA, but if you look at the DNA of every, all the different types of living creatures and all of the complexity of these living creatures, there is intelligence there. There had to have been somebody who created the world. It didn't just happen. But we can see a little bit, if you look at a few of, of the things that God created, we can learn a little bit about God. Um, one that I like to look at is the peacock. Now, the peacock, of course, is, is well known for the, the eyes on its feathers. When the peacock spreads its fan, there are those little eyes staring back at you. Um, a healthy peacock will have about 170 eyes looking back at you, evenly distributed. In between those eyes, or I should say around the outside, there should be 30 what are called T feathers, and they are just a feather that comes up and then kind of forms a T. You probably have never noticed them, but they're kind of the picture frame on the, on the peacock's fan that just kind of adds a completion to it and just, just adds to the beauty of it. But if you start to look at these eyes, how these eyes are formed, a, couple of, a number of things stand out. One of them is normally the stem of the feather that goes up through the middle of the feather is white. But a white line through the middle of the peacock's eyes the feather eyes, would be distracting. And it's not. Part of the eye has no stem going through it, but the part that does, the stem is brown so that it doesn't interrupt the color. It doesn't, it doesn't show. Um, but probably even more so, if you look at a peacock's feather eye, you can see a variety of colors. When I ask this, um, I usually get greens and browns and blues and purples. You have all these colors in the eye. But actually, there's no color on the feather at all. The feather is actually brown. The peacock's feather is just a plain brown. In fact, it's the same chemical that you have in your skin. Melanin is what they have in those feathers. It's just brown. But on that brown feather, there is a thin layer of a clear substance. And I say thin, about a half of a micron. That's four millionths of a meter thick. About, I'm, I'm estimating here, but I'm going to say about a thousandth of the thickness of a hair. So it's a very thin layer of a clear substance. And as the light hits the feather and bounces off, 
because of that thin layer of clear substance, only one color bounces back to your eye. It's kind of like if you've, if you've ever dumped oil on a, on a driveway and you look into the, that brown oil and you see a whole rainbow of colors. It's the same physics going on there. With the peacock, though, it's very carefully regulated because you have to have just the right thickness of that clear substance in order to get the right color. The error is only about five hundredths of a micron that, you can be, that it can vary before you change the color. Now, as you look at a feather, each... each um, the strand of the feather actually changes colors. It goes through various parts of the eye, and so some parts of it will be brown, and then some blue, and then some purple, and some more blue, and then some brown, and then some yellow. It's changing colors. At those boundary lines, they're not gradual boundary lines, they're sharp boundary lines. The thickness of that clear substance goes, is a certain thickness, boom, it changes thickness, new color, changes thickness, new color. It's instantaneous, it's, it's a very abrupt change. And you remember, if you remember the, the peacock's eye, the coloring of the eye, it, it has an interesting shape. And so each of those little um, barbules as they come through, getting the changes right is easy for the peacock because it's in its DNA. But I've seen the mathematical equations for calculating where you would need to change the colors if you were doing it, and they're nasty. And I teach math. Um, th th it's complex to get that, that very, that, that, um, the, those colors, just the right color, in the right place, just the right thickness of, of that clear substance, they actually estimate that it takes about 20, 000, uh, 20 kilobytes of information. Now, that doesn't seem like a huge amount when you deal with modern computers, but if you think about it, that's 20,000 letters to write the instructions for just the eye of the peacock. If I tried to tell you, if I had a student, let me put it this way, if I had a student who tried to turn in a research paper to me, 20,000 letters long, and they said, I didn't write this, it just kind of popped out of my word processor, I wouldn't believe them unless I read it, and it did make no sense whatsoever. If it made sense, we would know that you don't just get a 20,000 piece of information out of nothing. The peacock's eye is 20,000 pieces of information to, des to, to describe that, that eye. It's an intricate design. It had to come from a designer. But what I, wanted, what I wanted to think about is not so much where it came from, because I think we all would agree it came from God, but why? Why did God give the peacock this 170 eye feathers with all of this intricate design? Now, normally we would assume, oh, it's for the peahen's sake. The peahen looks at the, at, the, at the eyes, and it allows the peacock to attract a good peahen. But I actually, I've read this before, that the peahen's eyes are actually not good enough to see all of the detail that's actually there. I just saw research recently, and they said that under normal circumstances, the peahen never looks that high anyway. She's looking at the lower part of the feathers. She never even looks at the eyes when she's picking out her peacock. So it's not for her. So why did God make the peacock so beautiful? I think it's because God loves beauty. And he made us to love beauty, and he gave us beautiful things to look at. It doesn't, it's not necessary. The peacock could be brown and dull. It doesn't have to have all of this beautiful, intricate design. I think God just loves beauty. And because he loves beauty, he gave us beautiful things. You know, we have flowers that are of all kinds of colors. God didn't have to do it that way. He could have made them all brown. Or he could have given us eyes that couldn't see the color in the first place, even if they were colored. The beauty of the world around us isn't there because it has to be there. It's just because God gave it to us. He is a God who loves beauty. Um, looking at creation, um, we can see other things. I don't know if any of you are close enough to tell me what this is or not. Anybody know what this is? A platypus. The platypus points out to the fact that our God has a sense of humor. Um, let me talk a little bit. Let, actually, I ran across a poem about a platypus. I'm gonna sh I'll share with you. Um, it says, I like the duck-billed platypus because it is anomalous. I like the way it raises its family, partly birdly, partly mammally. I like its independent attitude. Let no one call it a duck-billed platitude. And that came from Ogden Nash, which anyway explains a lot of things. Um, but the, the, the platypus really is an a, a, a interesting creature in a, in a number of ways. Um, when they first discovered the platypus, they figured out a couple of things that were odd about it. First one, of course, it has a beaver's tail, but it's got a duck bill. The first time a platypus arrived in England from Australia, somebody looked at it and said, oh boy, somebody's having fun in Australia. 
and they took the scissors to the bill to try to cut it off because they were sure somebody had sewn a duck bill onto a beaver just as a joke. And I've been told that if you go to the museum in, in England, you can still see the scissor marks on their platypus where they were trying to cut off the bill because they were sure that, no, that it couldn't actually come in nature that way. It has uh, poisonous spurs. Uh, the males on their, on their feet, on their hind feet, have poisonous spurs. I don't think they're actually dangerous to humans, but they are significantly dangerous. They are, they are fairly strongly poisonous. So he's got poisonous spurs. Of course, probably what really threw scientists when they started studying the platypus was that it lays eggs, but it's a mammal. Mammals don't lay eggs. Any, any biology student in ninth grade can tell you that but mammals don't lay eggs. Uh, but the platypus does anyway. Um, and so does the spiny anteater. Um, originally, this was um, very difficult to figure out what was going on with the platypus. They're very shy creatures. Uh, they live in, in um, burrows along the river. And they're very hard to, to study. I read a book at one point in time, on, and they were telling you how, how hard it was to study them. Uh, some of the scientists um, set off dynamite in the rivers so they could study the platypus, which is not, in the long term, a great way of lo looking how they live, but uh, did give them some chances to study their bodies. Uh, but just figuring out how they lived, what they were doing. But they did discover that platypuses actually do lay eggs. Um, the, platyp the baby platypus then hatches out of the egg, and then the mother gives it milk. But a little differently than what most mammals do, the milk simply oozes out of her skin, and then the babies have to lick it off of her, the hair on the mother's stomach. So it's just, just kind of, the mother just kind of oozes milk uh, for the babies to drink until they're old enough to go off on their own. Uh, platypuses also have one really uh, amazing skill in that duck bill. The duck bill's not just for decoration or to be, to be funny. Um, they actually use it to find their food. In their, in their bill, there are electro um, detectors. They can detect electricity. And the way they use this is that in your body or in, in an animal's body, whenever you move, the nerves send electrical impulses. And so the animals, that the snails and the shrimp that the platypus is looking for in the bottom of its muddy river, their nerves and their muscles let off electrical impulses, just very small electrical impulses. And the platypus's bill can detect that electrical impulse and then zone in on the animal that's ready to eat and snatch it out of the mud from its electrical impulses inside its body. That's a pretty good system. That's a pretty cool system for a creature that is so weird. Um, during World War II, this may not really have a relevance, but I think it's an interesting story. During World War II, Winston Churchill asked that a uh, platypus be brought from Australia to England um, for, him, for him. And uh, platypuses are very hard to transport in captivity. They're very sensitive. Their diet was very, um, um, sus oh, what's the word I want? Mysterious at the time. They weren't, it was very difficult to figure out what to feed them. Uh, but they did actually succeed in getting this platypus from its home in Australia to the ship, got the ship onto the seas, and then remember this is during World War II, sailed most of the way to England as I understand it, and as it was coming up, um, there was a submarine attack, a German submarine attack. Submarine missed, the, the um, de destroyers around the ship dropped depth charges to try to get the submarine, and the uh, concussion from the depth charges killed the platypus. And so Winston Churchill got his platypus dead. And it wasn't quite what he was hoping for. They're, very, they're, very, they're not very hardy today, although there is um, evidence that they may have been hardier uh, before the flood. But I just, when you look at the platypus, God has a sense of humor. Um, just in looking at the platypus, he has a sense of humor. But as a couple of creationists have pointed out, when an evolutionist looks at a platypus, you know God has a sense of humor. Because they've got to try to figure out what this thing evolved from. And um, when you've got a duck beak, and it lays eggs, and it's got a beaver body, and spurs, poisonous spurs. What did this thing evolve from, anyway? Um, that just has to confuse the evolutionist. So we've learned a lot about God. One more thing that I want to mention, that, that when we look at our world, um, that we learn about God. And I'm going to kind of approach this from a different perspective. This is from C.S. Lewis. No, I'm borrowing this from C.S. Lewis. But C.S. Lewis says, if you look at our world, uh, the human world, we all know that there's right and wrong. We know that there is there are some things that are right and some things that are wrong. And as he points out, sometimes we don't admit it to ourselves, but we always know when someone else does something that's wrong. And so we, we know what's right and what's wrong. We may make excuses for ourselves, but 
ultimately we know that there are certain things that you shouldn't be doing and the things that you should be doing. We know that there's right and wrong. Where does that sense come from? Where do, where, do, where do we get that sense of right and wrong? Now, some people say it's just an instinct, just an animal instinct that we evolve certain instincts about right and wrong so that we can survive. But we know that's not true because there are times when your instincts are in conflict. For example, we have an instinct to save our own lives. Most of us in a situation of danger, instinctively, we try to save our own lives. Well, where we also have an instinct to try to save others. There is a, I, I think it's innate, especially if it's family, but even outside of the family, we as humans have a natural instinct to try to save others. Now, if we're in a situation where, we, where somebody needs saved, but it could cost us our life, we have two instincts. The one instinct is to run away, and the other instinct is to help. How do we decide which instinct to follow? Well, it's certainly not an instinct, because we're judging between instincts. It's not something we're just born with, we have a, a sense of moral right and wrong that is above our instincts. Let me give you another example, maybe help illustrate this. We all have an instinct of hunger, right? I shouldn't mention this right now, I know, but that's okay, hang with me for a few minutes. We all have an instinct of hunger. Is that a good instinct or a bad instinct? Let me, let me change that slightly when I ask what. We all have an instinct to eat, let's say it that way. Is that a good instinct or a bad instinct? Well, obviously it's a good instinct up to a point, and at that point it becomes a bad instinct too much eating, eating the wrong things, there's a bad instinct as well as a good instinct. How do we know it's good or bad? Well, that's because above that instinct, there's a sense of right and wrong, a sense of morality that is not an instinct, but it's put in control of our instincts. And so it can't just be an instinct. Now, some scientists, or some people will argue, well, let me, let me ask, well, well, some people will argue, well, it's just part of your culture. It, your, your morality, your sense of right and wrong is just part of your culture. But if that's really true, then you can't judge another culture as being right or wrong. Nazi culture said it was okay to kill the Jews. So if our morality is just part of our culture, for the Germans, killing the Jews during World War II was moral because that's what their culture said. We can't condemn South Africa for apartheid because in their culture, that's just the way it was. So if morals are cultural, how can we say that their culture is wrong? A lot of people, people today think it was, it's terrible that we had slavery in America for so many years before the Civil War and condemned the church for not having stopped it. But if, if morals are cultural, that was the culture before the Civil War. So how can you say it was wrong? Morals can't be cultural because we judge cultures on whether or not they're moral. Therefore, it's something above our culture. Morality does not come from our culture. That may be where we learn it, but that's not where it comes from. And it's not a scientific law, or you can't think of it as a scientific law, because scientific laws tell you this is what happens. If I teach you the laws, of or the, yeah, the laws of gravity and the equations of gravity, I'm not telling you when you drop an object, it should fall at this acceleration. I'm telling you it will fall at that acceleration, period. It will do it, because that's the law of nature. The moral law is what we all know we ought to be doing, that most of us aren't doing. It's a law, but it's a law that we all break. So it's not a natural law. It's not a scientific law, because scientific laws can't be broken. It's, a, it's something else. And really, when it comes right down to it, there is only one source of morality that makes sense. When you really examine it and look at all the options, there's only one source of morality that makes sense, and that is a God who is holy. If there is a God who is outside of our universe, who is the standard of right, then all of our morality makes sense. It makes sense that it's there, and it makes sense why we, don't, why, why we might not keep it, because God is the standard of right and wrong, and we're trying to live up to it. We may or may not be successful in doing so. That's another topic for another day. And I do want to comment on something that's very important, and that because this comes up in, in, in discussions. God does not tell us this is right and this is wrong arbitrarily. God says this is right because it is like him. Our standard of right and wrong is not whatever God decides to tell us. There are some religions that do believe that, that right and wrong are whatever God decides to tell you, which means tomorrow God could change his mind and what was right yesterday won't be right today. That's not what it is. It's right because it's like God. If it is like God, it is good. 
if it is not like God, it is bad. He doesn't, he, he is the standard of right. He doesn't have to tell us, oh, I decided today that murder is not good. No, he says murder is not a good thing because as God, I love life. It is simply a matter of my nature. Telling lies is wrong because I am truth, not because I decided I don't like lies today. It's not arbitrary. It's simply an outgrowth of who God is. And because there's a God, we have a sense of morality. And all of us do have a sense of morality. Anywhere you go in the world, while we might disagree with some of their culture, everywhere in the world, we know there's right and we know there's wrong. There's a natural sense because God has put it in our hearts that there is right and wrong. Going back to Romans chapter 1 where we started, he says, if I can find it, the invisible things of God are clearly seen from the creation of the world, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. We can look at God's world, at time, at space, at matter, at the vastness of the world, the minuteness of the world, the beauty of the world, the information of the world, the humor in the world, the, mor the morality in the world, and we can see God from his world. Now certainly, I'm not in any way suggesting that God's world is a better source of knowledge of God than his word. But what I am saying is that even if we didn't have his word, as Romans says, we are without excuse because we can see God in his world. And I hope that, that what I've done this morning is to point you to God, to look at what kind of a God we serve by just picking a few examples from his world, from his creation. For homework, I warned you, didn't I? Read Genesis chapter 3 if you want to do your homework. I know it's camp. You don't have to do homework. But if you want to do homework, you can read Genesis chapter 3 for tomorrow. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. And we thank you that you've revealed yourself in your world, that you've revealed yourself in your word, that you've shown us who you are. And we thank you that you've chosen to have a relationship with us comparison to all the things you have made, we really are insignificant, and yet you have made us significant by your love and by your sacrifice for us. And we thank you, God, for all that you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.